This is December 13th, 1999. This is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Program. And this morning we have us with uh, John Ray in part three of his presentation and recollections of his extensive military career. John, a week ago when you and I spoke, we left you as a prisoner of war in a place called Hamelburg. Uh, there had been an abortive uh, rescue attempt. You and some survivors of that great shootout went back to the camp. Um, can you tell us now what happened to you then? Surely. That's a good little one-liner summary you've given of that. Hamelburg, of course, is a, a village in Germany. I've not been back there uh, since these days. We realize that was 55 years ago now. <coughs> we returned to the camp and uh, uh, Colonel Paul R. Good, we called him Pop Good, uh, he continued of course to be our uh, senior officer, but he had had to uh, uh, pass the command, if you will, of the camp uh, back to a German major general whose name I do not know. Here we have a situation where American citizens were being transferred again, you might even say voluntarily, to German command. Really an astonishing thing to think about there. And, and a couple of days, two or three days later, the German Major General realized he had to get us out of there. The camp was simply not tenable for various reasons, among others that the barricades and all had been destroyed uh, in large measure by the attack. And so we were soon loaded into box cars, uh, railroad cars, in the German uh, railroad which would take us to Nuremberg. Quite a time here. They were, you may remember from way back in World War I days, the box car was called a, uh, a 40 and 8, or in French, 40 et that meant it could carry 40 men or eight horses. <clears throat> in this case, it carried something closer to 90 American and British prisoners of war, slammed in the, these cars with big heavy wooden doors, slammed shut, no light, no air, no water, no place to sit or anything, just all crammed right in these cars. And. <clears throat> In my car, I reverted to my old position of senior American officer, and uh, the Germans put me in the car last and handed me a sausage about close to a yard long and about four inches in diameter, and also a loaf of bread, and instructed me that that was to feed the men on this trip. <coughs> and so the door slammed. You might try to figure out yourself how it would be to divide a, a huge sausage among a hundred men without any knife, fork, or spoon. It was done. <coughs> we stopped en route to Nuremberg uh, several times, I suppose you could say for a pit stop, and also uh, give the American and British bombers a chance to uh, a attack the train. I don't remember exactly long, how long, possibly two days, might have been a little longer that we were aboard this train going to Nuremberg. Got to Nuremberg camp, and there we found that we were joining up with a goodly number of thousands of prisoners. We were like a small addition to uh, what was already in this camp. Somewhere along the line in Nuremberg, we were transferred again by marching on foot from Nuremberg to a camp called Mooseburg, M-O-O-S-Berg. I don't know just how to find it even on the map. And here by this time, the month of April was waning. We were getting into May, which we can realize by hindsight, we were getting toward VE Day. I say by hindsight, we didn't know that at the time. And in this camp in Mooseburg with uh, a goodly number of thousands of Americans uh, and British and other nationalities. <coughs> Colonel Good was uh, always our 
a senior American officer during these days, and he finally announced to us on or about my May 3rd birthday that uh, uh, he was taking command of this camp. In other words, that the German Major General was surrendering to him again. And this crusty old American soldier, Paul R. Good, gathered all of his senior officers, both British and American, together. In this case, senior meant majors, lieutenant colonels, and colonels, gathered us together and informed us as follows. This was actually in a little meeting room in a, in a crummy old barrack building in Mooseburg. And he said, the Americans will be taking over this camp very soon, by which he meant General Patton's Third Army will be taking over this camp. And so, therefore, the German Major General has surrendered to me. We have about 160,000 prisoners in this camp. That is 160,000. That's four times the population of Natick. <coughs> <coughs> and he said, you officers, of whom there were about 15 or, <coughs> or 20 of us in the room, <coughs> each of you is to be assigned to command, according to your rank, a brigade, a regiment, or a battalion of what will then be ex-prisoners. <coughs> in my case, as a young lieutenant colonel, that meant I was to have a regiment of about 5,000 allied prisoners for which I would be responsible. He said this responsibility will terminate at such time as you have delivered your entire command to their proper home nations. The men took rather exasperated size at this time. What would this mean? How long does it take to dispose of 5,000 men back to their various na nationalities? Just about at this moment, there was a knock on the door of Colonel Good's meeting. And Pop Good said, come in. And there stepped forward a figure familiar to me it was Major Al Gar, G-A-R-R, Al Gar. He had been my assistant before my capture. And Colonel Good said to Major Gar, what is your business? Major Gar was dressed very properly and spit and polished so forth compared to all of us prisoners who were so crummy and rather unshaven, dirty, and ill-uniformed and so forth. And Major Gar reported to Colonel Good, I'm here with instructions from Allied headquarters. That meant Ike's headquarters, General Eisenhower's headquarters. And with this, he handed a message to Colonel Good. Colonel Good opened the message. And it read as follows, because Colonel Good read it aloud to us, a brief message. Dear Colonel Good, Please release to the bearer, Lieutenant Colonel John Ray. And it was signed by the Adjutant General at uh, Supreme Headquarters. Whereupon Colonel Good got a rather wry look on his face, <laughs> an astonished look on his face. And here was Lieutenant Colonel John Ray, who had been placed in command only a moment before of uh, some thousands of ex-prisoners. He was hereby relieved of that command and turned over to Major Gar. And he climbed into the car that Major Gar had driven down there from who knows where. And it happened that the car concerned had been captured from the German army. And yet it was an American La Salle limousine of model maybe about 1930 or something like this. 35 maybe, <coughs> and Major Gar had been sent down from Schaaf for the purpose of releasing this one prisoner out of some 160,000. 
anybody could take this little event, I suppose, and make anything of it. I don't know. I'll have to leave that to the future people. No, let's, let's make something out of it right now, John. Why do you suppose that happened? Well, I can only guess that uh, either the commanding general First Army, whom I've already mentioned is General Four-Star General Courtney Hodges, or possibly even the commanding general of 12th Army Group, who was Four-Star General Omar Nelson Bradley, both of whom uh, had been my commanders during uh, recent years, and in the Bra case of Bradley, uh, for longer than that. I would say that one of those two generals caused that message to be written, and whether it was really, it came into existence because of a suggestion by Colonel John B. Medaris, whom I've mentioned earlier back during the Bulge Battle, who was my uh, immediate leader at that time, a staff officer for Courtney Hodges, or possibly even some initiation by First Lieutenant Roger Ray, my brother, who was uh, 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 in the same outfit, or just where it came from, I don't know. I suppose we could start all kind of reports about how I had some pull, pull somewhere. It might be fun to do that. Anybody's welcome to do with it as they see fit. Okay. Um. In the write-up of about you and your fellow officers of your class at West Point, yeah. uh, there is a line in here that caught my eye, that while he was a prisoner of war, he devoted himself to keep me, keep, keeping up morale. I think that's incredibly important, and I wonder if you could tell us some of the things that, um, that you did in that huge camp to keep up morale. <coughs> Well, I think uh, I'll address this question, a very good question, John, to the period in the Hamelberg camp. Because that's where I uh, served as a prisoner and as senior American officer for a longer period than anywhere else. And because it was, uh, I had uh, enough experience by that time as a prisoner that I thought that I had pretty well evaluated the conditions and the life of prisoners. So we'll take the period at Hamelberg camp, uh, which would have been like January and February, in particular of 1944. I had earlier mentioned, you recall, about being called upon by the German medics to, uh, uh, to rule on a question of euthanasia of two American men. Did I mention that the yes, other day? Yes, you did. Well, uh, surely that would be, in a certain sense, uh, a, a, uh, a zenith in morale building, uh, by my judgment. But somebody else might not agree. But we'll go back to Hamelberg, which was after Limburg. And I, this is now before the break-in by the bomb task force. That's where we're going back to. And in that place, we had... Uh, uh, something in more like 1,000 American uh, prisoners. All officers, incidentally, or nearly all, were very young officers, uh, second lieutenants and first lieutenants. They had come from, in many cases, for example, the 106th Infantry Division, sometimes quaintly called the Hungry and Sick Division. <laughs> And it's not a very nice term, but uh, uh, in a way, it was, uh, there was a lot of truth to this. Here we had, this was the highest number of a division possibly you've ever heard of in the U.S. Army in War II, the 106. It came into battle inexperienced, only partially trained, and really not ready for war. And it lost a large share of its officers and men. And these inexperienced people came to the camp. They uh, found themselves prisoners almost after a week or so of, or less maybe even, of service on the front in the bulge battle. And this was horrible. 
and these men would be in danger, in my opinion, today, and no doubt I felt the same at the time, of, of, of breaking down with poor morale because their war had been such a disaster for them. They had prepared for this thing back in the States uh, for uh, whatever number of months, let's say about 12 months typically, and they were just barely at the threshold of training when they got hit by, tough, by Hitler's toughest attack, uh, uh, which was the Bulge Battle. And their, their organization was hardly even formed, you could say, on the battle line back in the vicinity of Spa and Malmedy and Bastogne, long back in those uh, areas. So these men came in there and uh, <coughs> we were together in what amounted to a new camp. It had no procedures established. It didn't have any old pop good running it when we got there. And even the Germans who were trying to run this camp, I always credit people with uh, some good if I can find it. And uh, I'm sure that some of these Germans who were trying to run the camp for us were trying hard to run it decently for us in terms of food and health and warmth and thing. And they were terribly frustrated. The German leaders within the camp system were themselves frustrated. They had no coal, they had no uh, wood, they had practically no food for it. And so there was an opportunity here for the senior American officer, that was me, to work with these people to see if we couldn't do what we could to make life better for our men. This would have to do with something about clothing, some substitute for toilet paper, some substitute for fuel, for heat, for any kind of warmth. It would be astonishing for me to try, and it would be hard under the time pressure to put together, uh, time pressure here in our meetings, uh, for me to try to put together all the conditions that I think were very important. <coughs> During all of this period of January and February, I became close friends. I made it my business to become close friends with the Serbian prisoners of war who themselves had been in there for six years or so at Hamelburg. These are the Serbs, I mentioned this last time, who recently we've been referring to as in connection with ethnic cleansing in their country right now in the Kachivo area and so forth. Here, 55 years later, these must be the grandsons today of those men then. And these Serbs helped me personally to survive in terms of providing me with food and cigarettes, if I dare say it. Cigarettes were not in such terrible repute in those days as they are today. Right. And they gave some friendship <clears throat> and some kindness, and they taught us the experience of how to work with being a prisoner. Now, I learned through these men that it was possible to get out of that camp, to get out through the barbed wire over to the Serb camp. Yes, I was able to do that. I learned also, I, my own guts got a little bit tougher and stronger. Would you believe that lacking fuel <coughs> in the evenings, I, along with up to, let's say, 10 or 12 of my fellow prisoners, I would take these fellow prisoners through the wire over to some empty barrack buildings that could have been used for more prisoners, but at the time were not being so used. and. I took these 10 men in there and we ripped the guts out of empty barrack buildings as a source of firewood in order that we could heat our camp, heat our little barrack building. I'm talking really about everything so primitive that a few uh, bits of wood would go a long way to improving our circumstance. We would do that. The following morning, the German lieutenant, I don't remember his name at the moment, we called him Schickelgruber, lacking some other name for him. I think it's a name sometimes people gave to Hitler in those days, that is, Americans did. <coughs> Just among ourselves, we called this little fellow Schickelgruber. Now, he liked me. Schickelgruber thought I was great 
because I was an educated man and he was a professor in his uh, uh, civilian life before the war. He was a professor at the University of Berlin and he taught English. And he thought I was a pretty nifty thing to find an American soldier who uh, was able in some respect to deal in cultural subjects in conversation with my friend Schickel Gruber. I say friend, I was using him as my tool. And I used him for the purpose of improving the life of my men. And so Schickel Gruber came to me the day after we uh, ripped the uh, woodwork out of these barracks to use to, uh, as our fuel. Schickel Gruber said, Colonel, he himself was a lieutenant in the, Ber in the German army. And he would say, Colonel, something terrible has happened. He usually opened, he prefaced his addresses to me that way. Colonel, something terrible has happened. He said, some of your men have destroyed a barrack building uh, just across the way outside the wire. We must put an end to this. Why would they do such a thing to the Third Reich? And I would say, well, it must just be that they're cold. They must need some wood to get themselves warm. He said, why don't they ask me for coal? And I said, well, they don't feel free. After all, you hold high position here. They don't feel free to come to you. They would like to write you a letter about this. But they have no pen and ink. He said, why don't they ask me for ink? And I said, I will ask you for ink right now. He said, have them bring their pens to my office and get ink. I said, that's just what we'll do. Now, of course, not many prisoners have a pen, but it only took about 10 or 20 pens for us to carry out his bidding. Yes. And I would line up uh, uh, maybe 100 of my prisoners. We might have only 10 or 12 pens and stand up, stand outside his office and one at a time they would go in to his uh, ink flask, which was almost a quart of ink. And they would fill their, their pen with ink. They would walk out of his office and come back and squeeze the ink out on the ground and give the pen to the next fellow. Until before you know it, his quart of ink is gone. This rather infuriated him. He didn't like that. He caught on to what had happened for some reason that I will never be able to tell. He never took it out on me. I was uh, something like apart from my command in his view. He was very inexperienced as a soldier and he, uh, he did this kind of thing and I thought it was important. He said, you know, I think maybe I'd better speak to the troops, to the <coughs> And I said, well, all right. And he uh, wanted to make a little speech to them about destroying the project of the property of the Third Reich. So I stood him before uh, something like a thousand of our men. And as he was to make a speech about how he's trying to do better and keep us warmer and feed us better, my men, the whole thousand of them, responded to each line that he tried to say, saying, Think of a thousand voices coming back at this little fellow like this. And he realized immediately he could not handle American men this way. <clears throat> what shall he do, Colonel? Something terrible has happened. Your men have like uh, 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 yelled me out of my office. I said, I think you would do better if you deal with my chaplains and my Red Cross men instead of the whole batch. That'll be a much smaller group. And they, of course, are not prisoners of war, even though they're American Army chaplains and American Red Cross men. They are not prisoners of war. Therefore, they will have a special status. Maybe they will listen to you. And with this, he's, he would say, Schickel Gruber would say, yes, that's what we will do. And I would then march into his office. <coughs> These, uh, uh, perhaps about a dozen and a half or two dozen, U.S. Army chaplains and Red Cross civilians take them in there. <coughs> they all stood before him in his office, a room just about this size, just about the size of this room. I myself was not a part of that meeting. I let him meet with the chaplains and the Red Cross, and as 
and he explained to them very carefully uh, what must be done to make the, uh, the men uh, happier and more comfortable and warmer. And my chaplains and my Red Cross people uh, uh, responded. To, they knew how I wanted them to respond and make very clearly, he must produce or shut up. Well, while this was going on, and while I'm probably right now talking too much, but I don't know how to reduce it much, <coughs> I was behind these men. <coughs> they were all standing before him. He's sitting over in the corner. He didn't know it, but I was in the room behind these men. They were all in their German great coats, so that uh, there was quite a crowd there. It formed like a curtain for me to be behind, to be behind. And some won't believe what I'm about to tell you, but his coal scuttle was back behind there also. And I handed to each of these chaplains and each of these Red Cross men a couple of lumps of coal that they were able to put in their pockets from there. And I could skip out of the room. And lo and behold, when this meeting was over, not only had he failed to convince them of anything, but his coal was all gone. Chickle <laughs> Gruber's was. John, in answer to the question, <laughs> what did you do to raise morale, I think the answer you've given us is that you saved lives. You get the idea. You've saved lives. I think so. Can we talk a minute about something that we talked about before this tape sure. started? Stephen Ambrose wrote a book, a, a very best-selling book called Citizen Soldiers, in which he devotes a third of the book to the Battle of the Ardennes and the Battle yeah. of the Bulge. Uh, in it are some very disquieting statistics about the um, condition of the American troops trapped in Bastogne and uh, the subsequent battle that had led up to it. Um, one out of three didn't have an overcoat. Uh, 45,000 of these troops suffered from frostbite to the extent and uh, frozen feet that they were taken off the line. Um, they lived in horrible conditions for weeks and you were p not only part of this, you suffered through this too. Can you tell us at the foot soldier level what you witnessed and what you saw at those, in those days? I'll try. This is not going to be easy. I must repeat something I intended to, to uh, make very strong and clear at one of our earlier meetings. I myself, throughout this war, was not a foot soldier. I was a staff officer. Many staff officers, or at least the positions that, that they hold, are not particularly held in good repute by foot soldiers. I think you possibly know what I mean. Yes, sir, I do. And uh, I think that uh, um, the Marines uh, would also know exactly what I have in mind. But for me to presume to be able to tell you today, uh, in response to your question, how bad the conditions were for the foot soldier in the front line uh, is, is really very difficult. Difficult for me, because I really was not there. I, I can see that it would be difficult to comprehend this, how I could get captured without being in the position of a foot soldier. But that is a simple fact that I was. I was a staff officer, and not just a staff officer, but up at a very high level staff, far away from the troops in the organizational charts and so forth, very far away from the infantry soldier. Now, I, I can give a kind of a, a general answer about supply shortage, because that was my business back there, having to do with the supplies, not especially of overcoats, but to include overcoats, and gasoline, and munition, and uh, many other things that were in very short supply. I could uh, uh, <coughs> go into that in some detail, but I do not want to leave the, uh, uh, the feeling in the future listener to this, nor in your feelings, that I really know what goes on in the frostbitten trenches out there, because if I did know it, it would by, be by reading Stephen Ambrose or something, mm -hmm. not because of, of my experience then and there. I hope I come through about that all right. Yes, sir, you do. We were very, very short, because you might say of the great successes that we had had in August, September, October, we, had, we were so successful that we ran away from our supplies. We went all the way from Cherbourg, way back on the Atlantic coast, deep into Belgium. 
I don't know the distances very clearly, but it must be at least 400, 400 miles. And that's a hell of a big distance to be covering in those four months or so. We ran away from our own supplies. Tires were in short supply. Uh, we had rumors around those days, at least, that General Patton even, his name often comes up in these stories, <coughs> that he instructed his troops to swipe the tires off the trucks of other units if you must, but keep your trucks running, keep your tanks running. And a whole lot of bad things would have to come up. And of course, you will realize when you're short of gasoline, for example, that leads to a shortage in food and clothes and whatnot, because there's no way to deliver the stuff up to the front. <clears throat> now, I guess I'm surprised at some of the remarks that you quote briefly from uh, Stephen Ambrose. I didn't realize we would have had any soldiers uh, short of overcoats. Uh, I don't understand why that would be really. I don't know that I can enlighten everybody about that. I, I don't feel qualified to do that. Uh, I know that, that we had uh, just absolute hundreds, thousands of tons of supplies back in the port of Cherbourg and aboard ships off Cherbourg and in the <coughs> uh, on the, uh, the quays and the docks of Cherbourg. I left that out in our earlier talking uh, because of my feeling of a time shortage here. My yeah. inspection, which I made, of the port of Cherbourg at General Omar Bradley, Bradley's personal request that I, or direction that I did do that in November of 1944. Uh, and I reported back to General Bradley the conditions that I found at the port, which were, in my opinion, shameful in many respects. <coughs> that. We had German prisoners of war in the Cherbourg port handling some of those supplies. To my judgment and in my opinion at the time, those German prisoners of war were actually building obstacles, roadblocks, using our boxed uh, blankets and cots and food. They would uh, fix it so that the port was not particularly, not very uh, 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 accessible to the trucks that would haul it out. I thought that was kind of a unique observation. And I reported the same back to General Bradley, who in turn reported it to Washington and uh, uh, through Eisenhower and all that. There's so much to cover here. I cannot fit it really in the... In the all right. I just wanted your uh, view of that. It, it, it is so strong in, in, in this particular book that I thought, uh, who better to talk to than well, you about well, this today. Well, at, at that level, I can understand it. All right. Uh -huh. We're up to May uh -huh. of 1945. Right. Uh, we're going forward again now. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. You have just gotten a wonderful little message that you're going to go home, I think. That's it. Um, I have in my, my notes that you boarded a ship in June of 1945, and a couple of coincidences set in there. Your brother, Roger, who you had given your ring to on June 7th, 1944, uh, returned your ring to you. He was on board the ship. But in part of the, the convoy that uh, took you home, there was a destroyer et escort called the Martin Ray. And that was your brother. Yes. Uh, a ship in the Navy was named for him. My eldest brother, yes. Killed at Midway in the Battle of Midway. Yes, lost in the Battle of Midway, of Midway uh, <coughs> which of course has been called the <coughs> the turning point of the naval battle in War II. Yeah, <coughs> right. Now, you come home, and my notes say that you have a Purple Heart, a Prisoner of War medal, a Bronze Star. Did you have two Bronze Stars? I think so. All right. A Legion of Merit, the Quad de Guerre, and all the theater ribbons. Um, this is a very distinguished record. Your home and the war in Europe is over. The war in Asia, of course, in, in Japan, in the Pacific went on a few more months. Uh, from the notes you've given me today, I gather that you went on to the Pentagon when you That's came true. home. And served there until 46. Only for three or four months. Yeah. And then you went to West Point yeah. in January of 46 to June of 50. Yes. 
then Fort Sill, Oklahoma, till right. April of 51. Fort Lewis, Washington, to April 21st to December 51. And as you and I know, you're coming up to a very auspicious date where the Korean War started, or it has started in 51. June of 50 it began. Yeah. Uh, where were you when you heard about Korea breaking out? Gloucester, Massachusetts. Vacation. Having just completed my service, four and a half years of teaching law to the cadets at West Point. I had just been relieved from that assignment and was appointed at that time to go to Fort Sill, Oklahoma to get brushed up on my artillery work, which had, which had been, uh, shall we say, neglected in large measure for the previous four years. Can you think back specifically to the moment where you were in Gloucester, Massachusetts, enjoying yourself having served four years teaching law at West Point, and the word comes to you that another war has broken out or American troops are going to be involved again. Can you remember what you thought about that? Well, I suppose my thoughts would have been, uh, I, I, I probably don't have any real clear recollection. I can guess, knowing myself, that my first thought was, you'll probably be in it. Next it would be, you've had plenty of experience in North Africa and in Europe, but you don't know a thing about Asia, even though your two Navy brothers have fought throughout that war uh, on the Pacific side of the thing. And you're now going to Fort Sill, Oklahoma to get brushed up on the art techniques of field artillery in the U.S. Army and no doubt you'll be in Korea within a year. And that's what happened. What was your personal reaction to that? That's the fact of the matter, but what was the emotional fact? Well, <laughs> here we go again. Here we that's go about again. all. <laughs> that's about all. Of course, by this time, John, I had uh, uh, married an Army, U.S. Army lieutenant, Tova Schwartz, my beloved, whom I had met in Oxford, England, and who herself had served three and a half years in War II as a physical therapist in the what she called the uh, uh, body and fender works of the Second General Hospital. We had married. We had a wonderful life at West Point for four and a half years. We produced children, uh, two children, and the third one, by golly, was on the way at the time. And here we're going off to Fort Sill. We know about that. She knows about that. We will live there, uh, uh, but for something less than a year. Was she still in the service? Oh, no, but no. No, no she uh, got out immediately upon her uh, return from the European theater. Actually, she served over there about six months longer than I did, but uh, she uh, was uh, uh, returned to civilian status immediately. Uh, upon returning to the States. <clears throat> and so uh, she was prepared and our little family with children, uh, the eldest being uh, less than four years old, uh, with two children plus one on the way, we're ready to get on about it. I don't think we ever discussed whether it was a good idea or not. That's just the family we had. And uh, so it was. You were a long way at Fort Sill from your first assignment back in 39 where you were That's true. went into procurement and the artillery. Can you tell us any differences you noticed in that, uh, what's that, <coughs> well, 12, 12, 13 years? Had the Army changed in that see. respect? Had the Army changed? Our earliest weapon in 1939 was called the French 75. That meant a 75 millimeter uh, gun cannon. <coughs> which was model 1897. <coughs> it, was, it was designed and <coughs> created, even built by the French army. 1897, think of that. In those days, 1897 seemed further back in history, believe it or not, than it does to me today. <coughs> and here was this old weapon, that's what we began with, horse-drawn too. Drawn by six horses, pulled that 
French 75 in 1939, and in our 6th Field Artillery Regiment, which I mentioned earlier, I think, at Fort Hoyle, Maryland in 1939. We even had one retired horse, name of Rodney, in that regiment who had served at the Meuse Argonne in World War I. And Rodney had been brought to Fort uh, Hoyle, Maryland uh, to spend the rest of his days on Fort Hoyle never again to have any uh, uh, restraint on him, such as ropes or leather straps or anything, because he was an honored hero of World War I. Rodney was a horse, because he had pulled his French 75 at Merzargon out of the mud after all the other five horses in his team had been killed. It's hard for me not to stray around. That's, That's what the right. army was that I joined in 1890s. I mean, in 1939, with its 1897 weapons and horses and old soldiers from World War I were my, you might say, my early teachers, these enlisted men, like Sergeant Conklin and so the rest of uh, those uh, wonderful men uh, from War I who were still in service in 39. Now comes the uh, artillery at Fort Sill in 1940, uh, no, 1950. And we thought we were modern, no longer any horses. <coughs> we now were either self-propelled, uh, meaning on what looks like tanks, they're not really tanks, self-propelled howitzers, or uh, uh, truck-drawn uh, howitzers, 155s and 105s, which, of course, uh, were themselves uh, in later years, which we're not up to yet, we will be later on, uh, will be uh, re replaced by uh, even nuclear missiles and whatnot. Uh, okay. Ask me something more. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to go back just a, a minute here because generally we ask um, veterans a question about when they came home, 45, 46 in there. Uh, obviously, you were a, a professional military man. Uh, you are not, were not going to leave the service, but you were part of that group coming home back oh, into the definitely. States. I'd like you to tell me two things. First of all, you had time to reflect about what you'd been through. Um, and when we first talked here, we talked about the, the Battle of the Kasserine Pass. You remember that? Yeah. And you were talking about the weapons and the American, uh, the quality of the American weapons, their tanks, rifles, machine guns. Um, at the end of the war in 46, when you came home, you were reflecting again on that. Um, what did you think at the end of the war about the quality of the material that the Americans were using, the tanks, machine it's guns? It's a small correction. <coughs> it would be 1945, not 46. Uh, that, that we came home. Yes, sir. 40, 45 that we came home. Some of us didn't get home till 40. <laughs> well, oh, that's true. That's, <laughs> that's true. Excuse me, I realize that. But uh, uh, we came home in 45, believe it or not, uh, <clears throat> because uh, General Courtney Hodges, First Army Commander. And now I have to go back to the day that Al Gore took me back to First Army Headquarters. I'll just take a minute on that subject and try to help about this. <clears throat> when he picked me up in the La Salle limousine. He took me to the First Army Headquarters. I was taken right to the office of General Courtney Hodges and sat down for a little meeting just like you and I are having now. And General Hodges asked me to tell you some of the things that I've been telling you right now. <coughs> and after a while, <coughs> not too long, four-star general, mind you, that's a pretty impressive person. He said, uh, <coughs> well, we're packing up very soon now. John, he said, we're going to the Philippines. Mind you, this is uh, May of 1945. He's saying this to John. Yes. He says, we're going to the Philippines. <coughs> we will take command and put together a field army in the Philippines. This, this, I say again, May 1945. He has in mind, we'll be getting there about August of 45. In the meantime, he said, everybody's going to get 30 days leave. 
you know, U.S. Army or any part of it was not being disbanded at this moment. A year later, the answer would be very different, of course. But at June of 45, First Army is needed, an experienced field army command. We are going to the Philippines as quickly as we've had our 30 days leave back home. So get your, get your act together. And he probably saw that this young officer, possibly for the first time in his life, felt, oh no, I can't believe it. And he must have read something in my face and my demeanor. He said, you will have the option, John, whether you will go yourself, whether you will go with us. Most of us have not been in this war as long as you have, which for me by this time was a full three years. And by this time it was uh, eight campaigns on two continents. I'm not saying more than anybody else. I'm not in that business. It's a lot, though, when you put it all together. And two prison experiences. He said, John, you will have the option whether you go to the Philippines or not. And so you're going to take 30 days leave at home. And I want you to tell me, telephone me at my home in San, Io, San Antonio, Texas. He's saying this in Germany, right? And 30 days after we get home, I'll be in San Antonio, and you'll be on leave, you telephone me, and all you have to give me is a simple answer, do you want to come or not? And I said, General, I think I'm going to answer you now. I have to tell you, I've been looking forward to my own marriage. I feel as though I'm kind of worn out, but maybe I'll be better. If you really mean to give the option, I'm going to choose my marriage instead. I said, General, this is a very tough answer for me to give you. I never expected to be in such a position as to answer this way, but this will be my answer. I'm glad you told us that, John. And he said, thank you. He said, God bless you. Now, it turns out the First Army, including uh, uh, all my pals, uh, like uh, the the staff officers for uh, General Bradley and later General Hodges, a good many of them were able to go with First Army headquarters after the 30 days leave, went to the Philippines, and in a certain sad way, or how to say it, I don't know exactly, they got there just about VJ Day. And so they never did have to serve. They, <laughs> the headquarters was moved over there, and then I guess it was kind of disbanded, uh, maybe over there or maybe back home again, I don't know. I lost track of it after that. <laughs> I had just about run my string out. <laughs> I can uh, see that. So had they had. All right. Um, I asked you a question about the comparison of arms, thinking about it at the end of the war. <clears throat> vis-a-vis -vis the well, Casserine Pass. Well, uh, your, your question is very good. I can say that uh, there was great improvement uh, in the arms from 1939 up to what we needed to use during War II. I'll say in the years such as 43, 44, 45, I think that by that time the American arms industry had been so developed and uh, improved and under the leadership of Fr Franklin D. Roosevelt did just great things in every department of, uh, of military production that you can imagine in creating uh, new and also huge quantities, we must realize. The quantity is very important, just as is the quality. Uh, <coughs> so America had, had been uh, brought to the position that it could supply. You, know, you remember the numbers about the huge amounts of aircraft which in 1939 didn't even exist. They had to be created, designed, and, uh, and produced in numbers of great thousands and all. And uh, uh, the, the uh, American tanks, as of 1939, were, were really no good at all. Uh, I, 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 I don't feel myself to be an expert on any of these particular weapons. Maybe I was expert on the old French 75 I've described, but I, I don't know 
as much as perhaps uh, my audience would like me to know about the stuff uh, before the war in all the various categories or even during the war. But I would like to add this about it. Our American uh, production line back home was of huge importance. And uh, Tom Brokaw's recent book about the greatest generation uh, gives great credit in its way, and it should do so, for what our civilian people at home, including uh, women at home, uh, Rosie the Riveter and all was involved in making things really happen so we had the necessary qu quality and quantity of arms of all kinds. <coughs> Uh, it still was, of course, uh, uh, ancient, even in 1944, when we compare it to the nuclear arms and other stuff that uh, came in only a few years later. But I don't think it would be appropriate for me to try to make that comparison. Our arms, I guess we could say, uh, had uh, developed and improved appropriately to the situation in, uh, in War II. It's high noon uh, now, John, and we're going to end this in just a couple of minutes because I know we're going to be here again next week and take on what is one of the more, most important parts of your career because you, you kept getting larger assignments and now in a, this is going to be another continent you're going to, another theater of war. But yeah. I would like you to be thinking about things that um, that we're going to ask you next week. Among these are the high points, and, and you have such a long and varied career. I would like you to think about some very outstanding moments in your career. I would like you to think about outstanding people in your career. Um, I would like you to, if at all possible, think about something longer range that you could leave for the people 50 years from now that will be looking at this tape that to you is terribly important and maybe you've never um, said out loud before. And with that, I thank you for coming back here again today and next week we'll cover as much as we can of some of the things that you've asked me to talk about. Thank you again. It's been a pleasure, John. Thank you very much.